Hi everyone. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed uh, your uh, your coffee break and your Dutch uh, stolbafels. Um, my name is Mats. Uh, I will give this lecture on the fundamentals of uh, uh, the analysis of neuronal oscillations. Um, I will first uh, take a small recap of uh, what you looked at this morning. Uh, this morning, uh, Robert talked to you about the difference between evoked activity and induced activity. And when you have evoked activity, um, your brain signal is uh, phase locked to uh, your events or your stimulus. And when you have multiple of these events, then you can average uh, over trials. And your feature of interest will end up in your average. And this is useful because uh, in real life, we often have a lot of uncorrelated noise in our single trials, um, as you can see here. And when you then average over trials, uh, the, uh, the, the noise will average out, and you will, um, you will leave with your, um, your average signal, which still has your feature of interest. However, when you have induced activity, um, the, the brain signals are not phase locked over trials. So when you then average over trials, uh, you will uh, be left with, uh, with almost nothing. Robert also uh, talked about the different um, interesting aspects that uh, are present in the MEG or EEG data. Um, so we have uh, the time course of the activity. You can study the uh, event-related potentials or event-related field in case of MEG. Um, also, the spectral characteristics um, uh, can be studied with a power spectrum or a time result in a time frequency uh, response. And you can also look at the spatial distribution of the activity over the head. Um, and uh, you can use this, for example, to reconstruct the sources of activity in the brain. Uh, but no matter which analysis that you apply to your data, uh, you always have to think about um, the superposition of your source activity. So every signal records a superposition of all the underlying source, uh, source activity. Um, luckily, we can use our temporal and our spatial aspects of the data in order to try to tear apart these sources. Um, and in this lecture, uh, I will focus on uh, spectral decomposition. Uh, so now going to brain oscillations. We know that uh, brain signals contain oscillatory activity at multiple frequencies. And what you can see here is the very first MEG experiment done by Cohen in 1972. It's a replication study of the famous EG experiment uh, by Hans Berger in the 1920s, who for the very first time uh, showed uh, alpha oscillations. And what this experiment shows is that when subjects have their eyes uh, closed, then this 10 hertz uh, activity has a higher amplitude than when they have their eyes open. Um, and it's, uh, what is nice about this experiment is, is that you can see the, the effect uh, from the raw data. You can just look at this raw data with your naked eye and you can, you can see the, uh, the effect. Uh, but more recent um, findings on oscillations are less trivial and you can often not uh, see them with the naked eye and you need uh, more advanced techniques in order to find them. Uh, what I showed here is an, an example experiment uh, done by uh, Hogan Bohm and colleagues here at the Donnes Institute um, some years ago. Um, and they presented subjects uh, with these concentric rings that move to the center of the, uh, of the screen uh, in an MEG scanner. And while no interesting um, uh, oscillatory activity was clear from the raw data when you looked at it with the naked eye, if you represent the uh, amplitude of the activity as a function of time and frequency, um, they found a very robust <coughs> increase in uh, high, uh, high frequency oscillations and a decrease in low frequency oscillations. Uh, so in this lecture, the goal is uh, for you to understand uh, spectral analysis uh, and for you to be able to uh, interpret uh, figures like this. So as a little outline of what I will talk uh, uh, about in this lecture. Uh, first, I will start with the definition of spectral analysis. Namely, it's going from the time domain to the frequency domain. 
Uh, then I will talk about um, uh, the issues we have with finite and discrete sampling and how these lead to spectral leakage. Uh, and I will also mention how spectral leakage can be controlled by using uh, tapers. Uh, and in the end of the lecture, I will uh, devote time to time frequency analysis. So before we restart, um, let's uh, take uh, let's see if we are all on the same page and see uh, and, and define what an oscillation really is. <coughs> so an oscillation is nothing more than a line that wiggles back and forth relative to a fixed point. And there are three features that you have to keep in mind uh, about an oscillation. And the first one is the period. So this is the distance between one peak and the next. If we divide one by the period, uh, we get the frequency, so the amount of cycles that fit into one second, which is expressed in hertz. Second feature, um, if you take a look at this oscillation, you can see that uh, the peaks are not um, the same height everywhere. Um, so if we draw a line over the peaks, we get the envelope of the signal. And we can express the strength of our oscillation as the amplitude, uh, which is the uh, distance between the envelope and the, fig uh, the zero point. The third feature is the phase. Uh, and the phase tells you uh, uh, at which point in the uh, cycle of the oscillation you are at. Uh, so I expressed it here as these jagged lines. Um, and phase is always uh, relative to a arbitrary point. So for example, if we take this peak over here at zero degrees, um, then halfway through the cycle, we are at 180 degrees at the trough of the oscillation. And at 360 degrees, we are at the next peak. And that's where the new cycle starts. Uh, so in short, uh, three interesting features about an oscillation. Period gives you the frequency, the amplitude gives you the strength, and the phase gives you at which point in, in the cycle you are at. Moving on to spectral analysis. Um, what we do in spectral analysis is we deconstruct a time domain signal into its oscillatory components. And this is also called Fourier analysis. Um, in Fourier analysis, we use uh, simple oscillatory basis functions namely cosines and sines, and they are displayed here. So the top one is a cosine and the bottom one is sine. These are the same signal, but just uh, 90 degrees shifted relative to each other. And if we try to um, apply spectral analysis to this uh, signal, which looks a bit complicated, um, we can see that it is um, composed of these basis functions in red. So now we can spread them out and look at them in more detail. And we, can, uh, we find that the, the signal in blue is a, a, weighted con a, a weighted combination of the basis functions in red. And what's important here is that these basis functions each have their own frequency, their own as, uh, amplitude, and their own phase. So for example, the, the topmost basis function has the highest frequency, but only an intermediate um, amplitude relative to the other two. And we can visualize the, the contribution of each basis function uh, in the power spectrum. So here we see uh, the frequency on the x-axis and uh, the power, which is the, um, the square of the amplitude on the y-axis. So for the top basis function, uh, this is, looks like a 4 hertz oscillation um, with a power value of 16. Uh, what is important to uh, rem uh, remember in this um, in these power spectra is that we lost the phase information. So in this uh, power spectrum, you cannot read at which phase each oscillation is. So uh, to recap, in spectral analysis, we deconstruct our time domain signal into oscillatory components. And we use uh, simple oscillatory basis functions for this, uh, namely cosines and sines. Um, this way we express our signal in terms of frequency instead of time. Um, but keep in mind that mathematically these contain the same information. So we can always go back from frequency to time and vice versa. Is this all still clear? Okay, very good. Um, we can also think 
uh, think of spectral analysis in terms of linear regression. Uh, and this way we would uh, look at spectral analysis as, as linear regression using oscillatory basis functions. And uh, this is how it works. So m uh, most of you are probably familiar <coughs> to linear regression because also in, in um, MRI they use it a lot. Um, in linear regression, we try to uh, fit a set of beta weights uh, to a design matrix in order to, optim to optimally explain the variance in the signal. And in our case, uh, the design matrix consists of a set of uh, basis functions, namely the cosines and sines of different frequencies. <coughs> now the strength, uh, the, the beta weight uh, for each basis function tells you how much this basis function contributes to the data. And if we uh, combine the beta weights for the sine and uh, cosine of each frequency, we can uh, get the phase and amplitude estimate uh, for this frequency. So if we take um, these two uh, basis function as an example, and we uh, plot the beta weight for the cosine on the x-axis and for the sine on the y-axis, then we can get the amplitude of our uh, frequency estimate um, by drawing an arrow from the origin. And then the amplitude is equal to the, the, the length of this arrow. Um, the phase of this uh, specific frequency uh, we can get by taking the, fa the, the angle between the arrow and the, the x-axis. There is, however, one restriction, uh, and it is that basis functions should be orthogonal. Because we want every basis function to describe a unique amount of variance in the signal. Um, this brings two consequences. First consequence is that we cannot just randomly choose which frequencies we want to estimate, but um, an integer amount of cycles has to, to fit in the signal. And the second, um, the second consequence is that if we have an endpoint signal, we can only use n basis functions. We can look at these um, <coughs> consequences in a bit more detail. So consequence number one, frequencies are not arbitrary, but an integer amount of cycles should be able to fit in, um, in your signal. Um, this defines our frequency resolution, so the, the smallest difference in frequencies that we can estimate. And it is uh, determined by the length of our data segment. Um, this is called the Rayleigh frequency. So if we divide one by the total length of our segment, we get a frequency resolution. Um, an example, if our time window is one second, uh, then our frequency resolution is one divided by one is one hertz. And we can, divide, uh, we can estimate every multiple of one hertz. Then if our time window is 0.2 seconds, can anybody tell me what our frequency resolution is? Yeah, please. Nine. Yeah, exactly. So we divide open, uh, one by 0 0.2 seconds, we get a frequency resolution of five hertz, and we can estimate every multiple of five hertz. Our second consequence is that for an endpoint signal, we can only use n basis functions. And because for every frequency we need two basis functions, namely a sine and a cosine, in order to uh, estimate the amplitude and phase, for an endpoint signal we can only um, estimate n divided by two frequencies. Um, that means that our, the highest frequency that we can estimate uh, depends on our sampling frequency. If our sampling, uh, so if, um, so this is called the Nyquist frequency. Uh, and it is the sampling frequency divided by two. So if our sampling frequency is one kilohertz and we have a time window of one second, uh, who can tell me which uh, frequencies I can, uh, can estimate? One kilohertz. Yeah, <coughs> so the, the time window of one second tells the frequency resolution of one hertz so we can estimate multiples of one hertz. And the sampling frequency of one kilohertz uh, tells us that the maximum uh, frequency we can estimate is 500 hertz. 
Similarly, uh, with a sampling frequency of 400 hertz and a time window of 0.25 seconds, we have a frequency resolution of 4 hertz, and the highest frequency we can estimate is 200 hertz. Yes, please. <coughs> Sorry, in the latter example, why can't you estimate the frequency from the field? I mean, if you have 0.25 seconds, yeah. uh, you could um, construct a one second window, maybe? Yeah, if, if, you, if you would uh, add up your 0.25 second windows, then yes, you could do that. But we only have a 0.25 second window in this case. So this is a, a, just a new example. Okay. So we need everything between 0 and 4 of your calculation. No, that's true. Okay, so to recap, uh, in spectral analysis, we deconstruct the time domain signal into its oscillatory components. Um, this is called Fourier analysis, and we use uh, cosines and sines in order to do this. Uh, this way, we express our signal in terms of frequency instead of time, but these are mathematically the same. Um, I also showed you that um, spectral analysis is similar to linear regression using oscillatory basis functions in order to um, see how, how well each basis function fits to your data. Furthermore, each oscillatory component has an amplitude in the phase. And our frequency analysis is limited because um, discrete and finite sampling uh, constrain our frequency axis. Is everything still clear? All right. So then let's take a step back and see what our goal is when we're applying spectral analysis. What we want is we want to estimate the true observations in the data that we have observed. However, we only have a limited time available in our, for our Fourier transform. Um, so your brain is oscillating all the time, but we can only observe it during this one hour period uh, uh, of our experiment. And this means that uh, we are looking at our activity through a time restricted window. So if we make an analogy from um, from what we're trying to achieve to this, uh, this photograph, we could say um, <coughs> that we're trying to reconstruct the entire photograph from just a, a limited restricted window. In signaling, uh, pro signal processing terms, um, this is the same as tapering your data with a boxcar. So a boxcar is like a train wagon, and if you look at it from the side, you will see the rails, which is zero, then the boxcar is one, and then the rails is zero again. And only the data that you have observed is inside the box, and, and uh, um, yeah, you have to work with this. Furthermore, uh, we, all, we also have discrete sampling, so we can only um, uh, sample discrete segments of our, uh, in our data. Um, so going back to the analogy of the, of the picture, um, we want to reconstruct the entire picture but because of finite sampling, we only have a limited uh, box, a restricted box. And because of discrete sampling, we can only look at a pixelated version of this picture. Um, and this means that um, it, the true oscillations in the data cannot always be sampled. And this le leads <coughs> to uh, spectral leakage. And we can control spectral leakage with tapering. Uh, so what is spectral leakage? Um, Spectral leakage uh, occurs when the true oscillations uh, in the data are at frequencies that we cannot um, sample with a Fourier transform, um, and they spread their energy to the sampled frequencies. If we don't use tapers to control this, then this is similar to applying a boxcar taper, and each uh, specific taper has their own leakage profile, which tells you how much neighboring frequencies contribute to the uh, frequency estimates that we are interested in. So this is a boxcar, um, and what you can see, again, that inside the window, this is one, so all the data inside the window uh, can go through, but every, uh, everything outside of the box is suppressed. And this is the leakage profile of a boxcar taper. Um, and on the x-axis, this tells you the distance from the frequency that you try to estimate. And the y-axis tells you uh, how much energy these uh, frequencies contribute to, your, um, to the frequency that you try to estimate. 
So let's look at it uh, in an example. Uh, let's assume that we try to estimate a 10 hertz signal. Um, then here in the middle you have 10 hertz. This is the one we try to estimate. This is 11 hertz, 12 hertz, 13 hertz, and so on. This is 9, 8, 7, 6, and so on. Um, so all the neighboring frequencies contribute to the estimate of your uh, 10 hertz uh, frequency. In the middle we have the main lobe. So this is the amount of energy that's contributed by the frequency that we actually try to estimate. Um, and the side lobes tell you how much energy the other frequencies contribute. And what you can see here is that at 11, 12, and 13 hertz, and, um, and all these multiples of 1, there's a trough in this uh, profile. And this means that these frequencies do not contribute to our 10 hertz estimate, because these are the frequencies that are actually already sampled with a Fourier transform. And it's only the frequencies that we cannot sample that contribute to our 10 hertz estimate. So these are, for example, frequencies at 11 and a half hertz, 12.2 hertz, and so on. So everything in between. Um, now let's let's take a look at what actually caused this spectral leakage. So this is a uh, windowed uh, windowed piece of data. So you can look at this as, for example, one trial of one second of your uh, of your uh, data. And this is a, a two hertz oscillation, which fits nicely two cycles in the window. Uh, but we also have two um, pieces of data that do not fit <coughs> in the window nicely. Um, I think it's a two and a half hertz and a three and a quarter hertz oscillation. What, what we assume when, when we apply Fourier transform is that our signal is periodic. So we can visualize this by just repeating the signal. On, on both sides. And what you can see now is that for the first signal, which uh, fits nicely into the window, uh, when we repeat it, the transition from one window to the next is smooth. But for the other two uh, signals, which do not fit nicely into the window, um, they have sharp transitions from one window to the next. Uh, and this is what called spectral leakage, because uh, these sharp transitions have to be um, accounted for by many different frequencies. So that's how these different frequencies spread their energy to this um, estimate. Um, we can control this spectral leakage by using tapers. So what we then do is we taper the edges of the signal to zero. We can do this for each signal. And when we then make the signal periodic, we can see that for every signal, uh, the transition uh, between one window and the next is smooth. So there's no sharp transitions anymore, and we can control the spectral leakage. <coughs> Another example, this is our taper. If we apply this to a 41 hertz oscillation, we get this. And if we um, make this signal periodic, we can see that, again, at the edges, that there's a smooth transition. The nice thing about these, multi uh, about these tapers is that we we can use multiple of these tapers and benefit from their combined effect. <coughs> but I think that's the next slide. Um, so, um, yeah, I told you that spectral leakage happens when uh, the true oscillations in the data uh, are at frequencies that we cannot sample. If we don't control this with, um, uh, with tapers, then it's equal to applying a boxcar taper. And each taper has its uh, own specific leakage profile. And the leakage profile tells you how much uh, the, the frequency, nearby frequencies contribute to the estimate of your frequency of interest. So what you can see here is the box card taper. Um, it lets all the data go through inside the box and everything outside is, is, uh, um, is put to zero. And it has this specific leakage profile. If we now look at the Gaussian taper, we see that the main lobe of the uh, leakage profile is a lot wider, but the side lobes are smaller. And this is the Henning taper, <coughs> which is uh, used a lot. Um, and it has a more narrow main lobe, and the side lobes decrease as a function of distance. So again, what is nice about these tapers is that we can combine them and, and benefit from their combined effect. 
uh, and if we if we apply them, then what we actually do is we uh, smooth our frequency estimate. Uh, but we can also just say that we control the leakage. <coughs> so let's take a look at uh, how uh, multi-tapering works. Um, this is a piece of broadband activity uh, that is bandpass filtered between 60 and 90 hertz. And if we um, apply uh, Fourier analysis and we only use one taper, a heading taper, um, then we get a power spectrum like this. Um, and you can see that it looks very peaky. If we use more tapers, then you can see that the more tapers you use, 7, 19, 39, the more smooth our frequency spectrum becomes. But you can also see that the more you smooth, the more information you lose. Um, so what is the actual reason to use this multi-tapering? Um, well, you can imagine that this broadband activity um, looks very different at different trials. So every trial will result in a, a power spectrum similar to this one, uh, but they will have the peaks at different frequencies. Uh, if we wa then want to apply statistics, there's a lot of variation over trials. So probably we will end up with nothing significant because of the, uh, this amount of variation. If we first uh, smooth the frequency spectra on each trial, then we reduce the amount of variability over trials and we uh, become more sensitive in our statistical inference. Um, so now we, we're going to apply a few tapers to this 41 hertz uh, oscillation to see uh, what, what effect do they have. And we will use uh, the first three tapers in the so-called Slapian sequence. Uh, so the first <coughs> taper is the one in blue you've already seen. The second one is the one in green, um, which is the, the first taper, but then inverted once. And the red one is taper number three, and it's the blue one, but then inverted three times. So if we apply the first taper, then we see that it, it tapers the, the edges to zero. The second taper um, suppresses the uh, signal in the middle, and it uh, inverts the signal uh, twice. And the third taper suppresses the data at one-thirds and at two-thirds, um, and it inverts the data three times. But maybe it's easier to, to see what the effect of each taper is if we look at them uh, in the frequency domain. So the first taper has the effect that you get a, a, a peak exactly at 41 hertz. The second, uh, the second one gives you a peak at 40 hertz and at 42 hertz. And the third one gives you a more broad peak. So the way you use these, uh, these multiple tapers <coughs> in practice is that you apply each uh, taper to your signal independently, then you do a Fourier transform, and then you average the Fourier, uh, the, the Fourier uh, spectra uh, over tapers. And when to use multi-tapers? Well, uh, multi-tapers are usually used for high-frequency uh, components. Um, mostly because these high frequency components also contain a lot of variability uh, normally. <coughs> and for low frequencies, uh, we tend to use just a single taper and, and it's mostly uh, a handing taper is used. Um, another reason why for low frequencies you wouldn't use multi-tapers is because um, for low frequencies we really uh, run into the limits of our frequency resolution. So for example, if we uh, we want to tear apart our theta oscillations, which are between 4 and 7 hertz, and our alpha oscillations between 8 and 12 hertz, then um, if, we, if we are using multi-tapering, then we're going to smooth the frequency estimate, and we cannot tear apart these different, different aspects anymore. Yeah, that's exactly what we do. So, yes? And where is the border between low and high? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, the border is very vague. Um, so it, it kind of depends on uh, what your goal is. If you would like, if there's some reason why you would want to be able to um, 
uh, tear apart a signal at 32 hertz and at uh, 30 hertz, then still you wouldn't use multi-tapers. But um, this this um, border isn't isn't very um, well defined, so usually you just define it yourself. Okay, so tomorrow we're going to do a handsome session in which we're going to work with speed data. Then we have very long segments, uh, and actually that, that results in a very high frequency resolution. It's probably a frequency resolution that's much higher than what you actually are interested in. So also in that case, multi tapering would actually be useful. Although it's like more, we're not going to do multi tapering. Just for continuous data, if you have sections of 30 seconds and you have a frequency resolution of 1 30th of a hertz, that's probably not just what you're interested in. So multi tapering would be uh, an appropriate technique there as well. So the way you would implement uh, these analyses in field trip um, is <coughs> you would um, use our configuration uh, structure. We use the method MTM FFT. For low frequencies, we define our frequencies between 1 and 30 hertz, which is often like the range that you have to think about for low frequencies. Um, we use a one taper, which is the heading taper, and then we call our uh, frequency analysis. For high frequencies, we would use multi-tapers. So we still use the method MTM FFT. We define our uh, frequency of interest limit between 30 and 120 hertz. We use the DPSS taper, which refers to the Slapian sequence that I showed before. And we specify how much smoothing that we want. And uh, keep in mind here that the amount of smoothing uh, is a plus and a minus 8 hertz. So for a 40 hertz signal, this would be smoothing between 32 and 48 hertz. Uh, I think these are automatically uh, defined based on, on your parameters and uh, <coughs> the length of your data segment. So a short summary. Uh, in spectral analysis, we decompose our uh, time domain signal into its oscillatory components. But here we make the assumption that the, uh, the amplitude of, of the oscillation is the same throughout uh, our time window or throughout our experiment. Um, we talked about tapers and how tapers can be used in controlling spectral leakage. And each taper has its own specific leakage profile, which tells you how much uh, neighboring frequencies contribute to your frequency as estimate of interest. Um, then we talked about multi-tapers and how multi-tapers are often used for, especially for high frequencies, uh, in order to smooth your frequency estimate. <coughs> Everybody still following or any burning questions? Yes? Uh, I guess, could you go back to the previous slide? Basically, um, or maybe it was the one before, you said it was 32 to uh, 48 hertz that um, the 8... Uh, 8 hertz smoothing. Yeah, yeah. 8 hertz smoothing. Yeah, it should be 33 hertz, I guess. Why would it be right. 33 instead of 30 for when they were looking at a study for uh, giving the uh, 32 um, interest in 46? Sorry, can, can you say it again? So why is it that it starts at 33? The window is 30 to 120, right? Yes. Uh, so the frequencies that you are trying to estimate, you mean? Right. So why is it that you said that the smoothing would be between 32 and 48? Why, why those two numbers? Oh, uh, this is just uh, taking a, an example of a 40 hertz signal. Oh, I see. Uh, and, then, and then 8 hertz smoothing would mean uh, 40 minus 8 and 40 plus 8. Okay, I didn't know if there was a difference. Yeah. Thank you. Yes? How many tapers do you use, you mean? Uh, this is automatically uh, uh, defined by, by, the, <coughs> by the algorithm based on the parameters that you, that you use and the, the length of your, your window. Yeah. All right, then we'll move on to time frequency analysis. Um, so in time frequency analysis, um, typically, we, we think of brain signals uh, not as stationary, especially when we're studying a, <coughs> some kind of cognitive paradigm, then we think that um, the brain oscillations change their power uh, throughout uh, the, the, pro uh, the, the cognitive process. 
And what we can do in time frequency analysis um, is we divide our measured signal into uh, small segments, and then we apply Fourier analysis independently on each segment. Um, for the rest, time frequency analysis is not much different from just doing a Fourier analysis, uh, because all everything, all the problems that we ran into before apply here as well. Um, so the, the problems with discrete and finite sampling, spectral leakage, um, and how this can be controlled with, mo with the tapers, it all applies to time frequency analysis as well. If we want to um, implement time frequency analysis in field trip, we use the method MTM convol. So let's take a look at this, um, this example signal, and you can clearly see that the uh, the, the frequency of this oscillation is constant, but the amplitude uh, is highest in the middle. And whereas before we talked about uh, the power uh, of a specific frequency, where you uh, saw just a peak for e each frequency, uh, now we will express the power in a color value, and here red has the um, higher power, and we'll we will make a time frequency spectrum. Um, so in gray, this is the, the, the time segment that we apply a Fourier analysis on, and we slide this box over our, uh, our signal. What is important is that um, at the first part, and here as well, the time, our time window is, does not contain uh, data all the way through the window, so we cannot get an estimate, of a, 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 we cannot get an estimate yet. But at this moment, the time window is full of data, and we can get our first time frequency estimate. So we slide our box over the signal. And we get a, an estimate every time. And now you can see that for this specific frequency, the power is highest in the middle of the time axis. Um, so a little bit of time I, I should devote on the order of analyses and how this can be different uh, for evoked and for induced activity. As I said before, uh, with evoked activity, your um, brain signal is phase locked to a specific event. So you can just average the signal and then um, you can study the, uh, the feature in your average. And this way you reduce a lot of noise because all the noise canceled out in the average. Um, in evoke activity, uh, sorry, in induced activity, this is not the case. So your brain signals are not phase um, phase locked to your event. If you then would average uh, the signals over trials, then you would end up with um, basically nothing. Um, and the thing is, if we would apply time frequency analysis here, we can still get our uh, our, our frequency out of this, but. If we apply time frequency analysis here, then we wouldn't end up with anything that, that tells us anything about what, uh, what is happening in the brain. So what's a better way to do it for induced activity, which we cannot average first, is we apply time frequency analysis on every single trial, and then we, we average the time frequency <coughs> spectra at the end over trials. Um, obviously, in a real world situation, we uh, have way more noise in our data. Um, so then we also need a lot of trials in order to, to get our feature. And if we would then uh, apply time frequency analysis on every uh, single trial, only part of a feature can be seen in every trial, but if we average over trials, we can still get a complete picture. Going back to time frequency uh, analysis, uh, if we want to implement these types of analysis, there is a couple of parameters that we have to think about. Uh, and I will talk about these um, by referring to the time frequency plane that you can see over here. So time on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis. Uh, and as you can see, there's a, a grid on top of uh, the time frequency plane. And this denotes, um, each grid point here denotes one time frequency estimate. <coughs> So implementing this in field trip, uh, the method we use is MTM convol. 
And then the first parameter we have to think about is how do we want to cut off our frequency axis? Which frequencies do we want to estimate? Uh, this is what we specify in CFG.foy, so frequencies of interest. And similarly, we have to uh, specify how we want to cut up our time axis. So this is, these two uh, basically tell you how coarse the, the, the grid should be. Um, then the next parameter we have to specify is the width of our time segment, of our time window. So that's the gray box. And this tells you how, how much time you have at each time frequency estimation for doing your Fourier analysis. Um, this is specified in CFG dot um, T underscore F Tim Wynn. <coughs> so why do you provide three times 0 0.5? Why can't you just have 0 0.5? Uh, because uh, you can have a different uh, length of your time window uh, for different times. Sorry, for different frequencies. So, for example, if I would apply this to all frequencies between 2 and 100 hertz, I could say, I could say that uh, from the moment of 40 hertz onward, I should use smaller windows. What is important to keep in mind here is that although we uh, take an estimate at every grid point, at every time frequency point, this is not an instantaneous estimate of, of power. So the, the power is actually estimated over a tile of time and frequency. So it's an interpolation of uh, over time and frequency. Now, an obvious question is, how do I cut up my time frequency plane? Um, and here, this is the tricky part, because there, there are no basic rules. It really depends, um, it re it's really up to you how you uh, cut up your time frequency plane. For example, you could choose um, to have a different length of your time window for every frequency that you estimate. But if you do this, it becomes quite difficult to compare across frequencies. But you can also uh, decide to have the same, uh, the same uh, time length, the time window for every frequency. Um, so you have to think about these parameters depending on uh, what you want to investigate. So it depends on which frequency band that are you interested in and uh, on which time scale do you want to be able to say, hey, at, at this point, I do have a, a strong 10 hertz oscillation, for example, but 100 milliseconds later, not anymore. Well, this becomes quite difficult. So these are parameters that you have to think about even when um, uh, when designing an experiment. How, how long should your trials be and which uh, time resolution and frequency resolution will give, uh, give that to me when I start analyzing. What is the last definition you sent for? Uh, did, this one? Yeah. This is the amount of smoothing that you apply. So that's uh, cfg.tapsmofuk. <coughs> What yeah. happens when you choose a uh, very small uh, frequency, uh, frequencies of interest? Yeah. So the, your window is also small, uh, also, for example, uh, 0.5 seconds. I'm getting to that right now. Okay. Um, so there is a trade-off between time resolution and frequency resolution. Um, and this is something you also have to always keep in mind. Um, so if you look at this, um, this signal, it's a 60 hertz oscillation. Um, so it's not broadband, it's just really a 60 hertz oscillation. And if we would apply, ty uh, apply time frequency analysis here with a very short time window, then you would end up with an image like this. And from this uh, time frequency spectrum, you cannot say that it's a 60 hertz oscillation. So you cannot really say at which uh, frequency this uh, signal is oscillating. What you can say, however, is where it's the strongest, and it's in the middle, around one, one second. So if we, if we take longer and longer time windows, you can see that the frequency estimate becomes better and better. 
but in the end it's quite difficult to say at which point in time that the uh, oscillation is stronger um, so what this means is that if you want to have a good time resolution then your frequency resolution will suffer and vice versa so a small summary again um, I just talked about time frequency analysis um, how it's similar to Fourier analysis, but now we just apply Fourier analysis on short time segments. Um, I also talked about how the order of analysis uh, is different for um, time frequency analysis because evoked activity is phase locked and we can first average this. And if we do this for induced activity, we would lose our, our feature. So that's why we first uh, apply time frequency analysis and average later. Uh, and I just uh, talked about the uh, trade-off between time resolution and frequency resolution. If we want to have a good time resolution, then frequency resolution will suffer and the other way around. Yes? How do you do evoked activity? Do you subtract total from induced or? Because the evoked activity is so efficient. Yeah, so your evoked activity will probably also contain some induced activity, but once you average uh, this over trials, then you average out the induced activity, which is not face locked. I see. So you, to get evoked <coughs> activity, you average across trials, and then you apply time frequency analysis on the average. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, last part of this lecture, I will devote to wavelet analysis which is a similar uh, method to using um, Fourier analysis in calculating a time frequency representation, uh, but it's a bit less flexible. So in wavelet analysis, uh, we use the convolution of our signal uh, with a family of wavelets, um, and each wavelet then captures uh, the different frequency components of our signal. And if you don't know what convolution is, it's something like a local correlation. Um, and I will show this uh, in a few slides, how this works. Uh, first, if we want to implement this in field trip, we use um, the method wavelet. And a wavelet is nothing more than two things that we saw a lot in this lecture. <coughs> um, it's a taper applied <coughs> to a basis function. So the sines and the cosines of a specific frequency. And then we get something like this. And this is what we convolve with our signal. Um, so if we take this signal, this is the signal we're interested in. We take, one, the, we take our first wavelet. Uh, and we can see that uh, at the beginning of the signal, uh, the, the signal and the wavelet match up quite nice. Um, so we will get high correlations here. And then we start moving our wavelet and do a correlation every time. And the further we go, the more we see that the wavelet doesn't match up with the signal anymore, so the correlation will decrease. Um, I just said that um, in wavelet analysis, we have less flexibility of how we uh, cut up our time frequency plane, because in wavelet analysis, there's only one parameter that we can specify and that is um, the, uh, the width of our wavelet, so the amount of cycles that fit in the wavelet. Um, often five cycles is used. Uh, sometimes for higher frequencies, seven cycles is used, and for low frequencies, three cycles. But yeah, also here, there is not like one golden rule. What this means uh, is that if we have a five cycle wavelet, then at uh, low frequencies, the wavelet will be quite long, um, and this leads to a, a narrow uh, frequency resolution, but a quite poor time resolution. And the other way around, um, at high frequencies, the wavelet will be really short, so we have a good time resolution, but a, a more broad frequency resolution. Um, so to recap wavelet analysis, um, it's similar to Fourier analysis. It can lead to the same results, um, but it's a bit easier to use because you can only specify um, <coughs> the width of your wavelet. 
but with that you also lo lose a lot of flexibility in um, in cutting up your time frequency uh, play. Also, it ca can be computationally slower than, than Fourier analysis. Um, so if we would try to um, implement either wavelet analysis or Fourier analysis in field trip, <coughs> let's first take a look at uh, time frequency analysis with uh, by using Fourier and multi-tapers. So we specify the method MTM Conval. We specify the time and frequency of interest, uh, the length of our time window, and the amount of smoothing that we want. For wavelet analysis, we specify the method wavelet. Again, time and frequency of interest. And then we can only specify uh, the width of our wavelet, which is the same for all frequencies. So to summarize this, this lecture, um, I started out with spectral by talking about spectral analysis and what, what the definition is. And here we take our time domain signal and uh, decompose it into oscillatory components. Um, we talked about uh, tapers and how tapers can be used to uh, control spectral leakage. And each taper has their own specific leakage profile, which tells you um, how much energy the nearby frequencies contribute to your f the frequency that you try to estimate. Then we went on to time frequency analysis, um, which is simply Fourier analysis applied to small time segments, um, and how there is a trade-off between time resolution and frequency resolution. So if you want to have a good frequency resolution, your time <coughs> resolution will suffer and vice versa. And in the last part, I devoted some time to uh, wavelets, how this is a similar um, method to using Fourier analysis in getting a time frequency spectrum. Um, but it is uh, a bit easier <coughs> because there's only one parameter to choose, and you also lose some flexibility. So because of the flexibility that you uh, lose, many people here at the Donners uh, tend to use uh, Fourier analysis for doing time frequency analysis. Yeah, so the only thing I can think of is it's easier. There's less parameters you have to think about because you can only specify one. Can you combine them? Uh, first thing comes to mind, no, not that I know, but uh, let me outsource this one to Robert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in principle, it is, it is also possible to make wave the classification of wavelets more flexible so that for higher frequencies that the length of the wavelet increases. That, that is an option that is possible in EEG that in, in field trip we decided not to implement this because we already have MTM control with which we can do everything that we, that we can, can come up with. But in principle you can also use more wavelets and also do the same thing. So it's, 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 it's basically the whole spectral analysis uh, approach is a continuum of one method that can have a lot of parameters. Um, this is indeed one of the problems that you could also use the wavelet. It's most important that you think of that you think of these time frequency files in relation to your experimental research question, uh, because that that is where you often are con constrained con due to the um, the speed with which the brain is able to process information and how long you can make a reliable assumption of uh, accuracy, of accuracy in the brain using state memory. I think that that is actually more important than. <coughs> So what you will look at tomorrow in a, in a hands-on session uh, is time frequency analysis. Um, and you will get to play around with the different methods. So I think you're going to compare free analysis with, uh, with wavelets, for example. Um, you can tweak some of the parameters to see what the effects are on the, on the results, which you usually would not do on your own data. But this is example data, so then it's fine. Uh, you will take a look at. Um, how these power spectra and uh, time frequency spectra look if you just look at the raw power and if you uh, look at the power uh, compared to a baseline. And you will also learn uh, how to visualize these uh, results using filter. 
So I think that uh, concludes this lecture. So if you have any questions either now or in a few minutes with the recap of the day, then please uh, feel free to ask.